Okay, the development of green muscle. <laughs> Okay, so the Lubulosa program was a huge program. Um, it was funded by a number of international donor agencies and they were all very generous with their, their funding. funding. Uh, we had the Canadian Development Agency, DFID, which is the UK International Development Agency, DGIS, which is the Dutch Development Agency, SDC from Switzerland, and USAID, although not for all of the phases of Lubulosa. But we had this, this donor um, pool who all contributed money and almost uniquely collaborated together to, to fund the development of, of the locust biopesticide. And um, I'm not sure that I know of many other programs where so many donors have put in money into a pool and said, OK, we won't apply our own rules. You do do it as, as you do sort of thing. So there were four phases in the Lubulosa pro program. As with most scientific research, we were given three-year phases, three to four-year phases. So from 1993 to 2002, we were funded to a total of 10 million pounds or 17 million US dollars. That's using the exchange rate as it was then. Um, so there was a lot of money, but I think it was very well spent. And um, when I look back, I think we wasted very, very little of that cash. And, uh, and I, I hope I can convince you that we achieved a lot. Uh, we had a multidisciplinary team. All of that money didn't just go to CABI. Uh, CABI was the lead institute, but we uh, developed relationships with the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture in Benin, um, the Department for uh, Plant Protection in Niger, GTZ in Germany, and PPRI in South Africa. So all of these institutes were funded by Lubulosa. They all had scientists who had complementary expertise. We were very much a multidisciplinary team. And the guys quite quickly that you needed to develop quality control parameters so that each batch that you produced was going to perform in the same way as the previous batch so that you didn't get huge variations due to the production method um, of, of the fungus. Uh, we also started developing storage techniques at this stage. It was quite difficult to keep the spores um, viable in the long term, and uh, we started looking at how we might improve that. It wasn't until phase three that we started developing that model more, and I'll go into that again this afternoon. So here's, here's some pictures of green muscle, the oil formulation for ultra-low volume application. Um, we worked out that it had a half-life of six days in the field at 40 degrees C, so that was pretty good. So if you spray, you, you're still going to get effective um, control after, even after six days, although it depends on which field you're in, of course. But these were the preliminary data. Um, you can see the formula being poured into an aircraft tank there. You can spray ultra-low volume from planes. You can spray it from uh, trucks using an overmast, or you can spray using handheld sprayers all the time you calibrate the equipment to deliver a certain volume application rate. And in the case of Lubulosa, we use between one and two liters per hectare. So it's, it is actually a very low volume application, and it's pure oil. Uh, you can see Matt working in the field there, looking at the field cages that would be kept out in the field so that we could monitor the mortality of individual locusts. So by the time we got money for phase three, we were ready to do field trials on a whole range of grasshoppers, not just desert locusts, but Senegalese grasshoppers, African rice grasshoppers, variegated grasshoppers, Sahelian tree locust, brown locust, and desert locust. Desert locust was the most difficult because their populations tend to crash. Um, so they, they, they have upsurges and then, and then crashes. So we didn't get many chances to actually apply the fungus to desert locusts. We did some field comparisons with phenytrothion to look at the biotic factors, and we looked at thermoregulation. Developed a spore storage model, which I'll go into this afternoon. Um, improved the extraction and storage techniques, and again, I'll talk about that later. And established that our field application rate was best if we applied 50 grams of pure conidia powder per hectare. 
in two litres and we worked out the cost of that to be about ten dollars per hectare using our production system and I'll explain how we worked that out also this afternoon. Um, but if we look at some of the results that we got when we were looking at biotic factors, so I'm going to have to escape out of here somehow. Um, how do I do this? Press escape maybe. End. Do I? Okay. End. Okay. 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 All right. Let's go with biotic factors first. Okay. So this this is following from um, your question about whether we get this. Yes, it's a PDF. So we've got a. I can scroll through this. Okay. Okay. Uh, full screen. Where is that? I'm a Mac user. <laughs> uh, I am. I am. Is that the full screen? Uh, top right and side. Top right. Inside the red X. Yeah, that's it. Okay, that's as full as it's going to get. Good enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So following from your question, if it's a natural disease, what happens after the spray application? Does the pathogen cycle? Um, I'm going to go down like this, I guess. OK, so sorry. It worked. It worked? Yeah. <laughs> so to investigate secondary cycling, that is, when a, when a locust dies, do the spores go on to affect the next generation or indeed the population that's surrounding it. So um, we monitored the population of healthy hosts at the beginning of the season, uh, the hosts that were infected by that initial spray uh, application, looking for infective cadavers, uh, trying to monitor any transmission to new hosts from contact with the cadavers, and then counting the survivors at the end of the se season that were able to reproduce and go on to produce the next generation. So same picture. This is how we monitored um, some of the field trials. We'd spray large areas, take samples, um, look at populations in these bones. And what you would say is if there is no secondary cycling, and this is a sort of a mathematical model, every time you spray, the population is going to go up. So this is the predicted change in grasshopper densities. If every time you spray, there's no cycling of the disease in the environment. You spray, it crashes, it goes back up. You spray, it crashes, it goes back up. So that would be the biopesticide acting like a chemical. And if you assume that the, um, the pathogen is going to act with secondary cycling, you'll, you'll have a high population, you'll spray, it'll go down, and it'll stay down for quite some time, and then it'll rise, you might spray again, and you'll get a much lower um, yeah, disease or um, population density over time than you would with the, with the, the chemical model. OK, so this is called density-dependent horizontal transmission or secondary cycling. Uh, and obviously, it has important implications. You've got much lower densities if you can s prove that this is happening in the field. So let's have a look. We had two field trials. One was in 1996, over 50 hectares. So this is a relatively small field trial. And we compared metarhizium uh, with phenytrothion. That's the typical chemical that was used for locust uh, control operations. And you can see that when you spray for nitrothion, the red line, the population crashes within four days um, and then very slowly starts to increase. And the metarhizium population takes much longer to crash because the pathogen takes longer to actually affect um, the locust and cause mortality. But the effect of the, um, the spray application lasts much longer. And so by the end of the trial, you can see that the, the, the population of locusts in the metarhizium plots is, remains much lower. And you know, is this due to secondary cycling? Uh, if you look at the 1997 data, here we've got an 800 hectare plot. And again, you get almost identical patterns of mortality, very slow and maintains um, locust control uh, with the metarhizium and fast kill but rapid resurgence of the population with the phenytrothion. So this is all looking pretty good. 
So the assumption is that all infected hosts go on to become infective cadavers or new sources of inoculum. But when we looked in the field plots, what we actually found was looking for these infective cadavers that there were fewer than 0.25 infective cadavers per metre squared remaining in these sprayed areas. So given that they started here, at approximately 14 cadavers per metre squared, where are all the infected, where are all the dead insects going? We couldn't find them in the field. Um, so is it because they decay very rapidly and can't be found? So what we did was we, uh, in the lab, infected um, some populations of, of locusts. And uh, there are two categories of dead locust. One which has been killed by the fungus, but you can't see the fungus on the outside of the insect. And that's a mycosed insect. It's been killed, but it doesn't have spores on the outside. A sporulating cadaver uh, has the spores on the outside, just like the pictures that I showed you earlier on. So we had <coughs> groups of these cadavers, and then also ones that we, we just killed by freezing. So these were completely unaffected and uh, uninfected cadavers. And those are the red lines. And we put them out um, in the field. And we monitored them daily to see whether they were still there, whether they'd been removed. And the ones that had not been infected with the metarhizium at all disappeared very quickly from the field. They were scavenged within five days. You can see there we could hardly find a single uninfected cadaver, whereas the mycosed and the sporulating cadavers seemed to hang around. It was like nothing was really very interested in taking them away. And you can see some sharp drops there, which coincide with heavy rain events. And that seemed to um, have the, an impact on the number of cadavers that were there. But what it does show us is that they do hang around. So they really should, when, when we'd done our spray application, they really should have been there in the field when we went to look for them. And yet they weren't. So why is that? Um, maybe it's because they get predated before they die. So the locusts are becoming sick, and maybe the predators are able to take them off before they actually um, die of the fungus. So to test this, we did a highly technical experiment where we had locusts in the lab that were either infected with the fungus, but still alive, or not infected. And we had a great big plastic spider, which we dangle from above them and watch to see whether they would try to escape or not. And uh, these dots here show the, um, the, the sort of the escape mechanism of, of these um, uh, insects, whether they are infected or not. So the control locusts are red, and the infected locusts are green. They're infected with Bavaria. That's why they're green. Uh, so you can see that at the beginning, once, once we've inoculated them and they're not actually sick yet, the, um, the control and the infected locusts jump away from the, the, the plastic spider to an equal extent. But after six to seven days, you can see that there's a split in their escape mechanism. And, and the infected locusts are really are not so inclined to move away from the plastic spider horror story as the ones which are not infected. And we also me measured the distance that they actually moved if they did move away from the plastic spider. And again, the infected locusts moved less far away from the spider than the uninfected locusts. So there's a fitness thing here where it looks like the locusts are more um, susceptible to predation once they've been infected by the fungus, even though they're not yet dead. We're, we're having an impact on the ability of those, those locusts to actually escape from their natural enemies. And to look at that in the field, we put out um, some cadavers. And in the, um, this is in the, um, the large chemical plot where we had the phenytrothion um, sprayed or the, um, or the metarhizium sprayed, we put out infected locust cadavers in the plots and um, measured to see whether they would be taken away. So I think it's probably about once every two days, we'd 
put 100 cadavers into the field on a transect and then walk up and see whether you can see the cadavers where they were. Um, in the, um, the control plot and the plot where we sprayed metarhysium, and there's actually two lines here. This, this blue line is two lines. The control and the metarhysium plot are both plotted there. You just can't see them both because they're identical. The number of cadavers that were taken away remained at practically 100%. So every time we went back, almost all of the cadavers had gone. Whereas in the chemical plot, where if you looked towards the edge of that 800 hectare, 80 hectare plot, you could see that fewer cadavers were taken away. They were taken away because there were fewer natural enemies. And when you get to the middle of the chemical plot, you can see that that natural enemy population has been really hammered. There, there's nothing to take the locust cadavers away. So the phenytrothion has taken them out. And there's no effect when you spray the metarhysium. So there may be fewer cadavers as a result of the predation, but you're still getting all of the natural enemies there to protect your, your population, your, um, your crops or whatever from, the, um, from locust attack. So the selectivity of a biopesticide allowed the key natural enemies to be conserved. And that, um, and that uh, uh, appears to have increased the predation of those infected grasshoppers. And it contributes substantially to control because the natural enemies are removed with the chemical, then the population quickly recovers. As we see with the, the phenytrothion, it crashes down, but the locusts go up because the natural enemies are not there to take them away. Um, and while we've got these predators taking away these infected locusts, it actually it's the fact that the natural enemies remain there is just as important after a, after a spray application with metarhysium as... Uh, as, as having the secondary cycling. Um, yeah, I think that's all I need to say here. Yeah, okay. So uh, there we have some biotic factors. And I'd just like to take you through some more, some abiotic factors, which actually had a huge impact on some of our spray events. So we'd already showed that we could control locusts and grasshoppers in the field by spraying our oil formulations. And we got some really excellent field results where we could show population crashes and indeed the population staying down for much longer in comparison to phenytrothion. But we also got some really bad field results. So this is from South Africa um, in the Karoo in 1998 where we were spraying brown locusts. And we knew brown locusts were susceptible to our fungal isolate. We had excellent quality control, so we knew our fungal isolate when we sprayed it was, was fit and ready to go. But we got very poor or very unimpressive control when we sprayed in the field. And we needed to look at what abiotic factors were responsible for this. We've done a huge number of trials, and you can see that the effectiveness of the trials or the efficacy of the, of the spray um, was very variable. So it went from something like uh, the rice, groppers in, rice grasshoppers in Benin in 1996. We had 90% mortality by day 11. And yet that trial in the Karoo in 1997, 90% 90, 90 mortality was achieved by day 59. That's a huge range in the kind of um, efficacy that you might expect. So what is it that's causing that? This is typical. This is what happens with biopesticides all the time. What you need to do is understand why and then address it. So it's due to the environmental temperature and we're looking at the thermal ecology of the host. What we noticed when we were in South Africa is if you've got a hopper band, this is a brown, uh, brown locust hopper band, and that's the shadow of the Land Rover that we were carrying the scientists around in. And it was parked there while we were looking at hopper bands, trying to decide where our field plot would be. And we noticed that all of the hoppers there were basking in the sun, and they all avoided the shady area. So they were clearly elevating their temperature above what we would consider to be ambient. So what is the body temperature of a locust in the field? So. 
I don't know how to put this politely. How do you measure, it? How do you measure the body temperature of a locust in the field? Mm -hmm. So you take a very, very thin thermo probe and you stick it up the rear end <laughs> into the center of the body and you measure what the temperature is. Um, so if you look here, we've got um, time along the bottom from 6 a.m. in the morning uh, through to uh, 6 p.m. in the evening. And we've got the soil temperature measured in the blue, which is, becomes very, very warm in the Karoo. Uh, we've got the temperature 20 centimetres above the soil, uh, which is more moderate. And then the temperature of the locust, which is incredibly flat. As soon as the sun comes out, 7 o'clock, they're elevating their body temperatures, they're basking, so that they maintain 38 to 40 degrees centigrade for the entire day. And then once the sun goes down, their body temperature drops. So this is very interesting. You know, we actually needed to measure the body temperature of the locust, not the temperature that was actually existing in the field. So, and then if you look at the thermosensitivity profiles of locusts and metarhizium, you can see that they're completely different. So the pathogen has an optimum temperature of about 27 degrees. Uh, by the time you get to 36, 37, the pathogen is no longer able to grow. Whereas locusts are really perfectly happy at 40 odd centigrade. And uh, so their thermal profiles are actually rather incompatible. So the pathogen performance will depend on whether the daytime conditions allow the locusts to thermoregulate. If the sun's out and they can thermoregulate, then the pathogen really can't grow because the locust is much at a, at a temperature that's much higher than the pathogen can grow. Um, but if the nighttime temperatures are good, that's when the pathogen has its opportunity to grow because the locusts can't elevate their body temperatures above that of the pathogen. <coughs> So if we look at um, the effects of the thermal regime on mortality of the desert, des of desert locusts, so in the field, I mean, in the, in the lab now, we've got three populations of locusts that have been inoculated with the fungal pathogen. One population is kept at constant 30 degrees centigrade, and you can see what happens to that. It's the red line. The population instantly crashes and it's, it's down to 90% within six or seven days. If you allow a population to thermoregulate just as it would like to um, for 16 days, you can see that you get no, almost no mortality um, as a result of fungal infection. But then put that, after 16 days, put that population at a constant 30 and the pathogen's there, it's just unable to grow at the time. And as soon as it hits its optimum, it's causing mortality in the population. Even if you hold them uh, for 32 days, thermoregulating, and then expose the, the locusts to a constant 30, again, the pathogen is there, it's hiding, it's waiting, and it kicks in and it kills them. So the locusts are increasing their body temperature. But the interesting thing is that locusts that are uninfected increase their body temperature, they thermoregulate, and they thermoregulate to an optimum of about 40. But infected locusts thermoregulate to a much higher temperature. So this is what we would call behavioral fever. And if they're infected, they are, um, they're going to thermoregulate to a much higher degree. So this is even worse news for the pathogen. So infected locusts are showing a behavioral fever. They're elevating their temp body temperature above what is normal for a locust once they're infected. So we set up an experiment where we would allow these locusts to, to sit on cages with a, with a light and, and maintain their body temperature, but we could control what temperature they could maintain. So by moving the, the, the cage mesh further away from the light, they could only achieve a certain temperature. By having the cage mesh very close, they could elevate their body temperatures more. <coughs> and then we looked at the effect of this on the pathogen. So if we, um, all of these, well, the controls are at the top, so they're not important. We had three populations, all inoculated with the fungus. 
and we allowed one population, the blue poor population, to thermoregulate but below what they would normally thermoregulate to in the field. And you can see that the pathogen kills that population very quickly. If you allow them only to thermoregulate to their normal thermoregulation temperature that they would have in the field, you can see that that's the intermediate one and the pathogen still kills them um, by, by the end, by, by day 46, they're mostly dead. But if you allow them to fever, that has an impact on the pathogen efficacy. So this is why they're elevating their temperature more. You can see that that really does affect the the pathogen and the, the speed of kill or the rate of kill that is possible because of this behavioral thing. I can't remember where I'm going with this. Hold on a second. Okay, so what does this, assuming that we've got this behavior, which we know we have, how does this actually affect um, the virulence in the field? Um, so we're applying the pathogen over a huge range of different ecosystems. Um, this is northern Spain. Here, this is um, near Cotonou in Benin. It's a kind of lush sort of, sub, sort of tropical. It's 30 degrees and extremely humid, quite heavy cloud cover. Um, this is where the variegated grasshopper lives. It's also uh, much more lush and green, um, Senegalese grasshopper. So a wide range of different um, locations where we'd be aiming to apply this. And what we need to know then is what is the effect of these locations on the efficacy of the spray application so that we can make strategies and advise people on whether they should or should not spray and get an effective product. Okay, so there's a model where we characterize the thermoecology of the locust targets. Well, we've done that. We've got the probes inserted. We know what they're doing. Um, and you characterize the effect of that body temperature on the pathogen. So we can see that by thermoregulating to different temperatures, it has more or less effect on the speed of kill of the pathogen. And then if you link that with local climate data and you link the all of those data together and integrate it in a GIS system, you should then be able to predict where and when you can spray your locust control product and expect to have good efficacy. So we did that. Uh, this is Spain, northern, um, the entire um, Spain, and there are MET stations which um, record and keep data on the daily min and max temperature, and those are marked in with the red spots. And then, um, of course, these are at different elevations, and elevation uh, affects temperature. So you've got little localized areas where you know what the actual temperature is. But if you um, overlay that with the elevation, you can actually smooth out that map so you can see what temperature it is across the entire map of Spain. Interpret it to um, daily climate surfaces. And then you can have an hourly body temperature estimate. So if you've got the daily min and the daily max temperature, you can do a sine curve to show what that temperature would be doing on an hourly rate. So you get the hourly temperature surface and then um, calculate what the hourly body temperature would be according to each of these um, points. So if you've got the body temperature, you know what the pathogen will do at each, each temperature, and then you can get the daily proportional path pathogen growth, which will be mostly at night. Um, but for each hour, you know how much that pathogen can grow. And then you can get a predicted virulence or control um, for Spain. And if we take the data for April 2000, you can see that there are large areas, these blue areas, um, where it will take greater than 34 days to kill the locusts after spraying. And this may not be acceptable. But there are certain areas where you can see that um, you'll, you'll, you'll get death within 7 to 13 days or even 14 to 19 days, which is perfectly acceptable. And we've got spray trial data on each of those red spots. And then if you look at the picture in May, it changes cons considerably. And you can see that areas that once were blue have become 
yellow and perfectly acceptable for spray applications, and areas that were acceptable have become unacceptable. I'll just zip back, you see how it changes. That's just one month difference. So using these data, you can very carefully target your, your spray applications. Okay, and then finally, of course, if it takes more than 34 days to kill an adult locust, it's going to go on and reproduce, lay eggs, and the population's going to be building. If it takes 34 days to kill a first instar locust, that might still be okay, because it's not going to go on to reproduce, and you actually will have effective control. So this looks bad when you assume adults, but if you look at it for different instars, you can see that the picture changes. So if, you, if you're targeting first instar locusts, you're going to be good whether you spray in April, May, or even June in most areas, you will not allow that locust population to reproduce and go on to, to, to build. Uh, if you're targeting third instars, well, you'd better spray in April or May, because if you leave it till June, there are huge areas that are blue, and those, those populations are going to go on to maturity, will lay eggs, and you won't have an effective control program. And if you're spraying fifth instars, you've got to do it in April, or you don't really stand a chance. Is that a question? Or the one, so not quite that. Okay. From, this, from that information, I'm assuming yes. that the fungus will not pass on to the eggs. No, it doesn't. No. Is there, is there a, a factor that eliminates that, or other than you know, that skin eggs prevent the, the fungal infection? Or? I'm not sure. I think it's just not in the biology of the fungus to to do that. That's not. It's not yeah. what it does. It cycles through through yeah, through not through eggs anyway. Uh, um, but, um, but there is an impact on, on egg laying, actually. So when you've got a locust that's thermoregulating, trying to keep itself re free of the fungus, it has an impact on fecundity. So they, may, they, they even try to lay more eggs, but they are not as viable as, 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 as locusts that are uninfected. Yes, at the back. That's a tricky question. So there's very little work been done on resistance to fungal biopesticides. Um, I don't think, Todd, maybe you can say, I don't think there's been a single documented case, but I, I wouldn't say it's impossible. No. Yeah. I have a yes. question about um, the, the instars. Of course, they're smaller, so technically it would take a lower dose to kill them of the fungus. Yeah. How, do you know how they thermoregulate differently? Are they because of their smaller size and larger surface to volume ratio, are they thermoregulating at a lower temperature or higher temperature? That's a really good question, and I don't know the answer to that. You, you think it, yeah. well, if they're forcing their temperature up, they might not be able to do that if they're smaller. Yeah. They've got less surface area exposed to the sun, no. which might make them more susceptible. No. It should be the other way around, because you have a larger surface area per unit volume if you're smaller. I know, I thought about that, but then I thought, well, what you're trying to do is raise your temperature higher. That's right. So you need to, it kind of depends on the aspect ratio of the bug could be. And how much surface is getting the sun? I don't know. But it's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> is, is, is it simply a size, a size to dose, vol uh, dose re relationship, or is it is the thermoregulation in there somehow? Yeah, I, I would expect in the sort of behavior issue that the, the younger guys don't quite sell themselves as being much smaller and being more vulnerable to all kinds of predations. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's true. I don't know the answer to this. <laughs> I don't even know whether we looked at the difference between first and, and adults with respect to their temperature profiles. We may have done. Um, I would have been in the lab at the time. <laughs> but I, I guess it wasn't, probably it wasn't a yeah. question because yeah. just generally we expect that the smaller instars um, are going to require less dose to die and, and you know, the yeah. evidence is all there. Yeah. But then when you started talking about the temperature, I thought, oh, oh, well, maybe they're not able to keep the high temperature and in that case make them more susceptible. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Thesis for somebody? <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. Any change in the feeding behavior? Yes, they, they become much less hungry once they're infected. 
and, uh, uh, and we did we did try and separate this from the thermoregulatory behavior so in the field that if they're infected they're, they're they're spending more time elevating their temperature to try and rid themselves of the fungal disease is it just that that means that they eat less but no it isn't they they do eat less when they're infected by the fungus they become lethargic they fly less there are many pre-lethal effects that all work in the favor of control yeah Okay, I don't know if there are any more beyond here. We can provide effective um, locus control, but the variable for performance um, means that it can't simply replace chemicals. We've got to decide strategically where and when you can place this biopesticide and not expect it to work under all circumstances because it certainly won't. Um, so, and the key to that is understanding the ecology and the host pathogen interaction. And it says we are making, this is an old slide, we made significant progress towards being able to develop this. Um, so no longer sp the spray and pray kind of application that often occurs with, with biopesticides. So I'm going to go back to Lubulosa, and, but please feel free to ask questions on that. Um, we're nearly done. You don't need to get too tired of my voice. So finally, phase four. So we'd, basically, we'd established what we could do with this, and it was very promising. We weren't saying we could cure the world of locusts forever, but we were saying we've got something that will work. If you know your temperature, if you know what you're doing, you can have effective locust control using a biopesticide. There's no reason not to use it if you've got the right conditions. So phase four was basically concentrating on licensing and technology transfer. We knew that as a, as a research project, we couldn't continue forever uh, producing this and selling it. So that wasn't our, in our job description. So we had to transfer all of this technology over to a, pub, a, a private company. Um, we asked a number of people, a number of biopesticide producers, if they'd be willing to do this. A lot of the European ones said no way. We ended up with a company called Biocontrol Products, BCP, in, in Durban in South Africa that were just starting up. They were producing a nematode fungus, the Pycelomyces lilacinus, and they were very interested in adding to their product portfolio. So they licensed, um, they, they took the technology transfer and they licensed green muscle, and they became the only licensed producer by the end of 2002 when the project actually finished. We assisted with the registration. We, went, we, we provided registration dossier for the entire product. Um, we assisted with promotion. We continued to do demonstration trials and uh, product stewardship. Negotiating with FAO, who have this very strange procedure for buying locust control um, chemicals, they, they basically they say, oh, there's a locust outbreak. Everybody put in a tender to provide us with X number of hectares worth of chemical product, and they'll take the lowest tender and they'll buy the product. And uh, green muscle really didn't fit into this because it was slightly more expensive than chemicals. And uh, if we said, well, you know, you can use this for just, just for the, the environmentally sensitive areas. We clearly have an advantage there. And they said, well, yes, but you've only got one producer. How can we put it out to tender? It's not fair. The, it's the, the, the market is sewn up for them. We can't condone that. So there are all kinds of issues. FAO very, very slowly began to work with us a bit more. But even now, the situation is not ideal. We also established some village brigades where there was a more um, cons consistent demand for locust control products, or in fact grasshopper control products. But the village brigades, as much as they, they liked green muscle, found that it was more expensive than, than the chemical products that they could get, running at $5 a hectare and ours at $10 a hectare, and they really couldn't justify spraying our locust product in their villages so as soon as Lubulosa finished, the village brigade stopped spraying green muscle. So it wasn't the happiest ending, but we achieved a hell of a lot. And the green muscle is still out there. Um, and given that that market turned out to be not ideal, I sort of want to put it to the audience. What would have happened if somebody, when they received that phase one proposal to say we can develop a product for locusts and grasshoppers if we'd have three or four reviewers that had said oh, 
there's no market for locust and grasshopper products. You can't, even if you manage to produce the ultimate product, which I think we did, there'll never be a market for it. We would never have that funding and none of this work would ever have happened. And I think that would have been a disaster. Um, but it just goes to show what a delicate path we tread when we're applying for funding and how the opinions of one person could actually squash something that has very great promise. Finally, the chain of ownership of green muscle. Sorry. Just yeah. On, on yeah. that point, um, yeah. I'm not sure I fully understand from your previous slides, it seems yeah. that per application, yes, the green muscle is more expensive. Yeah. But over the long term, over say a course of five years, wouldn't it be cheaper? Absolutely, it, yeah, I can think of all of those justifications, but the market drivers, FAO and, and very poor village brigades in, in West Africa, don't see it that way. And it's not a scientific view, but it's the market view. You see yeah. the cost today, not, yeah. not, it's a very short term view. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the curse of chemicals because they're fast, mm -hmm. and yes. in many cases they're cheap, and so you don't have to take a long term view. Even to resistance, people don't take long-term views. No, oh, yeah, it's true. It today, like yes. two weeks from now, oh, it's not fixing it anymore. Where's the next chemical? It's reactive, not proactive. It is. Yes, mm -hmm. that's true. So where is Green Muscle today? So Green Muscle was licensed to BCP. Very similar product called Green Guard was developed in Australia alongside our project. Um, and that was, that was commercialized by BioCare in Australia. And at the same time, it seems unrelated, but Microbio in Littlehampton in West Sussex in the UK developed some nematode products. And these were all nice little small to medium enterprises doing their little thing for local niche markets. They were, oh dear, what happened there? That's the Mac problem. Becca Underwood bought all three of these companies uh, about two, three years ago, something like that. And I thought, well, that's wonderful. You know, this is a, a reasonably large company and they've, they've embraced all of these biological products and, uh, you know, things are looking very good and indeed they continue to look good. And in September this year, BASF bought Becca Underwood and now they own the whole package. So things have gone multinational. Uh, we'll see what happens. Did they buy all of Becca Underwood or just their that little cluster of biologicals? Ah, that I don't know. I know certainly the cluster of biologicals. Yeah, uh, I'm I, not I've sure. Heard, I've heard that okay. they bought the cluster of the, of the biopesticides, but ah. I didn't, it, it wasn't okay. clear. It, was, it didn't sound like it was the whole company. Right, okay. It could be. Yeah. That's about all they did. Nematodes mm. and biopesticides. Yeah, yes. Where is BASF? Okay. Where are they based on? Germany, that? yes. Yeah, it's the big German, German chemical company. So we'll see what happens from here. It'll be very interesting. Uh, Stefan Juronski is trying to develop either Green Muscle or Green Guard for use in the, in the US. Uh, he's, he's in Montana, yeah. There's an issue with the fact that there are exotic isolates there that he's battling with. So uh, the key to this is to producing at lower cost? Eventually that would be the, the, the key? Uh, to lower the cost of production? I think lowering the cost of production would certainly help, but I think the market is, is just weird for locusts and grasshoppers full stop. And maybe BASF have more muscle and can drive this better, I don't know. And I hope they do, you know, if, if we have the power of a big multinational company behind green muscle, maybe the situation will change, but we'll have to watch this space. There's also, yeah. sorry, there's also, um, to sell a chemical at five dollars a hectare doesn't sound like the price that we pay here. No. So they're they're tailoring that price for a market. They're probably they may be even taking a loss at that price. Yeah. Whereas a ten dollars a hectare, which to us would seem like a gift, yeah. um, is is not subsidized in, in any sense. No. Yeah. Does your experience using indigenous uh, strain versus foreign strain? That's a long discussion. Um, my opinion is if, if, the ice, if, the, if the fungal genus exists in the country, probably it makes no difference to introduce an exotic one. But regulatory authorities and governments have different opinions on that. MET 52 is from Austria. 
um, and that is registered here and in, in the US. So you can overcome these hurdles. Um, bringing something tropical into uh, a very temperate climate probably wouldn't work anyway just because of the temperature profile thing that we've been looking at and you know you have to you really ought to match your fungal pathogen with your environment as far as possible um, personally i would say it's okay but it's something that we're restricted by governmental decisions more than anything have you got an opinion on that todd i just yeah. want to ask about the history of man 52 because yeah. um, I, I know the Yes. Okay. Yes, and he 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 can no, I I didn't mention it, but he collected it from Austria. Yeah. Yeah, and. Uh, yeah, and uh, and somehow Bayer got it, and I think there was some discussion as to whether they got it. Not illegally, but whether they really had full license to go ahead and you know develop it or it's, not. It's a good situation. Yeah. Yeah. And that is Bear really the owner? Are they still licensing it? They didn't just buy it. Uh, from my understanding, they're licensing it from Bear. But right. I could be wrong. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Now, you said bringing a tropical strain into a temperate place would, with the temperature profile, wouldn't that just increase efficacy because it's cooler? Well, I guess it might. Yeah. I get, yeah, it, it may, yeah. It, Yes, I suppose, yeah, temperature matching may well have an advantage there, yeah. Yeah. It varies. So the, the green mussel locust strain is very specific to locusts and grasshoppers. We, we hardly got any non-target impact at all. With, with um, Botanigard, the GHA, it's actually incredibly broad spectrum. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. You know, as, f as far as commercially, GHA, you know, it, it, they could almost apply it to anything and it would have some effects, I think. Yeah. yeah. Commercially, they probably prefer that. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yes. There's also spatial targeting as well, of course. So, you know, for, for example, in the chicken houses where we're, we're trying to control um, house flies, there are the natural enemy population in, in, the, in the litter underneath these chickens is, is very important in controlling the fly populations in the larval stages. And we're spraying um, the, the, the Bavaria on the walls around so that when the flies emerge from the pupae and they crawl up the walls to sort of stretch and dry their wings and harden off that's when they're actually acquiring the dose and by spraying on the <coughs> walls you're not you won't have any effect on the natural enemies even though this is a broad spectrum thing so so there's a sort of a targeting thing there as well that's possible yeah Any more questions I just a yeah. comment um, if any of you were here for the virus seminar, we did talk about EISF acquiring um, Becker Underwood's biopesticides. And the, the people who spoke at that one, Jacques Anima, had worked at Pest Management Regulatory Agency and had a kind of an interesting view of how these things were progressing. And one of the reasons they said that the big companies like EISF um, are looking at their current pesticides, like imidacloprid, which is a very it's the most widely used insecticide in the world at this point, and their profile for its lifespan is being shortened because of concern about long-term honeybee uh, damage. And they thought that concern would go away, but it's not going away. And the other thing that they based a lot of their economics on is um, and, um, GMOs and stacking, and, and this apparently is instead of just one set of genes, there's another set of genes that can back up and to avoid resistance, but the resistance is developing anyway, and so they're looking at those, those major products, and their lifespan is not this long, it's this long. So they're starting to look around for how are they going to, what are their next products, and they're focusing on the biopesticides. Mm -hmm. And they're buying the biopesticide, um, what's on the shelf at Becker Underwood, developed or not. And this is predicted to happen more and more, 
that the larger companies are now going to focus on. We've been basically kind of under the radar of the large companies developing biopesticides, and they don't think the market's there. We don't think they think the market's there, but they're starting to realize that they're just could, that could be where their market is. So whether that's good or bad, um, I'm not sure. I guess it's good if you want to sell a company and make lots of money, but it might not be good in the long run for the market, for the price of these things in the market, uh, because if they control the market, they control the price. So uh, just, just something to think about and watch for the future. Mm. Yeah, It's a low risk strategy for them as well. They obviously, mm -hmm. BASF, are more than capable of developing their own biopesticides. They realized that the most cost-effective thing to do would be to buy a company that's already done it, that's got the proven products and they can just go, go ahead. Developing these things from scratch is a big deal and they, they made a, yeah, an executive decision on buying what exists rather than trying to compete with it. And yeah. I've been told, uh, and I won't mention the company, that if we do in, in our lab develop a biopesticide there would be a company that would be willing to buy it from us. They, they're not in the, the business of developing them, but they would be buying products. Mm. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> For what it is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Very much. Mm -hmm.